Okay. So on today's episode of The Idiot Quilter Presents, I have a very special guest. This is somebody I know, I do call a friend, and we are friends because we both belong to the same online group called The Quilter's Way, and that's where we first met. And uh, well, this is Shirley, Shirley Heinemann. And Shirley, can you tell us where you're located? Yes, I am located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I live not too far from Kim Jameson Hurst. Who's the uh, creator of The Quilter's Way. That yeah. is correct. So that's great. So how long have you been quilting and sewing? Um, I won't say how many years, but I'll say um, since I was uh, maybe five years old, six years old. Oh, so you've only been doing it for maybe 10 years. Okay. <laughs> kind of a thing so obviously you have had a lifetime of doing this kind of thing so I'm sure you know an awful lot about this uh art form so and we'll find out so how did you get started then if you started at such an early age we um actually I started on a treadle sewing machine that my mom had and then I progressed from there to a an electric one but I started making doll clothes uh, and uh, yeah, for my, you know, my Barbies. And yeah. Things. Yes. I think yeah. a lot of people got started making doll clothes and things like that, especially when you started at such a, a young age as well. So was there anyone in your family who influenced you? Um, not really. No one. Um, my mom sewed a little bit. She used to make my sister and I clothes. But no one really. No. So no. you just sort of uh, just got into it because you were interested. Yes, I started garment sewing um, for uh, the reason that I couldn't buy clothes for myself because I'm very small. And so I uh, got into the sewing part just so I wouldn't have to go out and disappoint myself trying to find clothes that fit. Right. So, and uh, I became a, um, I took stretch and sew classes years ago, mm. and uh, of course, home ec, but I did become a stretch and sew instructor, mm. and I worked from uh, the shop, and then I did uh, have my own little sewing business, and I taught sewing classes, and yeah. Okay, so when you say stretch and sew, I'm assuming you mean stretching your body, not the fabric. <laughs> no, it was, it was, uh, well, that's, uh, that's an interesting thing there. I never thought of it that way, but um, no, it was uh, working with knits, knit fabrics and things like that. And uh, I made, I made all my own clothes. I made all my, pretty much my husband's clothes, my kid's clothes. And, oh. and uh, yeah. you were busy. Yes. Yes. So did, I was. did you have, uh, like you mentioned, out of the shop and that, did you actually have a business then yourself? Yes, I had a home business and I ordered fabrics from the U.S. Um, and uh, yeah, and I taught sewing classes out of my home. I would have maybe five or six ladies come in and yep. So, okay, yeah. so that's, yeah. So, uh, Lots of experience on both ends of it, doing it as a recreational hobby and doing it as a business too. Yes, and, and I, I, yep. I did work as well. Like I worked at the store and everything and I've worked in numerous fabric stores. But yes, I did, I did the sewing classes in the evening. Oh, okay, I see. So when you say you worked at a sewing store, is that what, was it a, a small store? Or was it like... Uh, yeah. I've, I've worked at um, uh, Fabric Land. I've worked mm. at, uh, oh, where else? Um, it was a shop in, um, it was quite a, quite a large store in Regina when we lived, when I lived in Regina. And I worked there for a while and, uh, and then uh, illness took over and uh, I kind of got away from it. So and so you're back at it now. Now, are you teaching any classes at this time? No, um, I had planned on um, maybe starting some sewing. And well, actually, I planned on doing craft classes, but then COVID hit 
And, uh, but most of my life I've been caregiver. So, um, and then when I got sick, then sort of everything kind of slowed down for me. Right. Just actually, since I've joined Chatterbox Quilts is um, when I've really gotten back into the sewing and so, yes. Yeah, well, that's sewing is very can be a very social hobby as well as we know and the whole thing with COVID and now being able to do zoom classes and and groups and things like that I think that's opened up a whole new world for a lot of people you know yeah Um, yeah. you don't have to travel anywhere to go to a class you can do it all online so Yeah. yeah and because I because I um my health issues and everything I um kind of kept to myself and I wouldn't go out anywhere and everything like that so um when I found technology you know um it it was just like okay I can actually talk to my daughter or talk to someone else without having to leave the house yeah it's been kind of definitely if one thing that COVID has taught us it's taught us how to use the technology to stay in touch with people and you know and that that is, I think it's a good thing. I, I enjoy online well, classes and well, all those kind of things. So I see you've got a few things hanging up behind you. So yeah. my next question is, what is, if you have a favorite creation? Um, yes, I do, but I don't have it because I've given it, I gifted it. Um, it was something that I really put myself out there because my daughter wanted a dragon quilt for her husband. And uh, when she asked me to do it, it was like, okay, uh, sure, I can do that. And then she when she told me she wanted a, a California king, mm-hmm. then it was like, okay, I've got to make this <laughs> thing and quilt it. And she she paid for everything and so I made a California king I used a panel and I ordered fabric from a a matching fabric from a store in Canada here and it wouldn't fit in my living room when I had to to, uh, sandwich it and then it was like okay now I have to quilt this thing and I did quilt it on my sewing machine I did an edge-to-edge design oh wow machine yeah and that was that was a um I guess it would be my most favorite because it challenged me to really think uh, about what I wanted to do and uh and how I was going to do things because I'd never done anything like that before yeah never Uh, and and you did it on a domestic sewing machine yes I had yeah I did. I have a uh, Faf Creative 4.5, and I did it in uh, in the hoop. And I think it took me almost 271 hoopings. Oh, wow. uh, I did it. Yeah, and so it's like yeah, trying to fit a California king yeah. in my small space, but I did it. And, and you no, know, I remember when we were talking one time about you doing in the hoop and uh, and I said, and you've actually done a quilt that size in the hoop because I yeah. gave it a try and I had mixed success with it. And I think it's what determined that I was going to get a long arm. It was after trying that. So I really admire your ability for one to take on something like that and two to use the technology as well. <laughs> Technology was easier than figuring out how I was going to um, hold it up. And that's where my step stool and bungee cords came in. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, a lot of a lot of quilters out there, they just they take a look at projects that size and they look at what they've got for equipment and give up at that point. But you embrace the technology, you figured it out, and you managed to do that. You are a goddess of in the hoop. I can tell you that right now. (laughs) And and I hope you'll like on your, we'll talk a little bit later about your YouTube channel now, but I do hope on your YouTube channel that one day you'll show some of that. Yes. Um, Because I would definitely be interested in it. And I know a lot of other people that would be interested in that kind of thing too, I'm sure. Yes. So I'm going to turn my attention now to, oh, before I go away from your favorite creation, do you want to talk a little bit about the ones behind you? Um, yes. Um, 
I did in uh, back in, I think it was 1990 or something like that. We moved from Saskatchewan to Alberta and I had no friends here. We lived on an acreage. So I did, um, I did make a quilt. My first one was in, um, it was a kaleidoscope quilt mm. and it was a, it wasn't so much of a challenge, but um, when I started getting back into sewing and quilting, I decided I have a book from Eleanor Burns and it was, it's the second edition in 1979. So, mm -hmm. and so I went to my stash because all I have is like had was clothing fabric and things like that. So I decided to do a log cabin quilt and it's still here. Yeah. I, I grabbed a whole bunch of fabrics from, it was, it wasn't, it was just, I got to try this. I got to yeah. see if I can do it. And uh, so it's still sitting there waiting to be finished. And I don't call them UFOs. I call them their PhDs. PhDs. Yes. What's... Projects half done. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. when I say I'm, I'm working on my PhD. Yeah. Uh, it's like I'm. <laughs> yeah, I get it. It's a... and, but that, that's a really lovely looking quilt. Like. I that, had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing. So, well, obviously, <laughs> it, it worked. And what about yeah. the other two? Um, the so after um, after I made tried this, I thought, okay, I'm going to try the half square triangle triangles and everything like that. So this one was a pattern from I can't remember where, <laughs> but again, I took out a bunch of fabrics and just put them together. And that, I think they're all double. And then after I got brave and I decided, okay, I'm going to follow a pattern. And so this one was, a, um, I did have some 100% cottons. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to make, uh, follow a pattern. And uh, it was a free pattern from someplace. I can't remember where, but so I made that one and I have um, progressed to, other things that yeah. yeah yeah so basically you you started off in what i i would consider sort of the reverse thing most people start with a pattern and as they get more comfortable with all of that then they may branch out and start altering patterns or creating their own patterns it sounds like you almost did that in reverse yeah um most of the things i've been making are I haven't followed a pattern. I've just taken the fabrics that I have, put them together. I struggle with coordinating fabrics and things like that. Being a garment sewer, um, you usually make yourself a pair of pants. Right. Or, and then what you do is you pick a color that goes with it. But I struggle with putting two prints together mm. I and the color combinations and putting things like this together. Mm. So that's what I'm sort of doing. And I, I just take things and put them together. And I have so many UFOs and everything now that, or sorry, PhDs. Yes, PhDs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't call them that. But yeah, uh, yeah well, um, for saying you struggle with prints and things like that, just from the examples you've, you've shown us, um, I think you have an intuitive sense about mm -hmm. what goes together. And that probably comes from your garment sewing. Yeah, uh, I, but I do have to, I have to sort of draw it out and put things together, coloring and things like that before I even start because, um, and then I'll make one block right? and then I'll, I'll look at it. And then it's like, okay, now what is that going to look like if I put two or three together or something? But um, so that I have a lot of, um, I guess they call them orphan blocks. Oh, yes. I have a, a bunch of those too. My stash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always have to test it out and then I try to visualize it. Yeah. And, now, yeah. do you take those orphan blocks at some point and put them all together into one quilt? Yes. Yep. I, well, um, lately I've been on a, on a roll with just trying everything. I try everything. Just whatever I can. Yep. I just soak in all the knowledge and everything like that and then try to do it myself. It's like, okay, how can I do this? And Well, that's how we learn. I, I believe that's how we learn. And also, I think that really 
keys into the creative aspect of this whole art form as well you know and i i really enjoyed that kind of thing that's why i enjoy about quilting the most it's never the same thing twice yeah you, you know you move on you learn new things you put yeah. new things together you try you experiment it's only fabric if it doesn't work doesn't work move yeah. on yes yeah. so speaking of moving on uh, to my next question then so kind of then as a quilter are you how would you characterize yourself? Are you traditional? Are you modern? Are you art quilt or oriented? Not, not art quilt, no. But um, I seem to graduate more. I get. I guess I would say traditional because I, I really like the the small prints and, um, I guess they called them calicos or something. You know. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I like that sort of combination of um, of prints and that. Yeah, so, I guess. So, yeah, yeah, traditional, yeah. but yeah. maybe traditional with a twist. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you put your own kind of thing onto it, uh, yeah. so it makes it more unique. So yeah, so I am assuming you are sitting in your sewing area. Yes. So. I call my sanctuary <laughs> okay your sanctuary so how is your sanctuary organized how do you lay it out or um i i would not say it's organized i would say it's <laughs> organized um but uh uh it's a i live in a condo um i'm alone and i have a uh, bedroom I have two bedrooms and one of them I dedicated to my craft room and sewing room. And I have a walk-in closet and then there's a washroom in behind that. Oh. And so all of all of this area here is my crafts because I do other things. I do crochet knitting, um, card making. Um, I've tried everything, <laughs> absolutely everything. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very very small. I have everything yeah. around me that I can work and don't have to get up too many times. However, I do need to get up because um, I can't sit that long or stand that long. Yeah. So yeah, but it's very compact. Is what I'm gathering what you're saying with it, and so everything's kind of in arm's reach, and that's not a bad thing. That's exactly right. Yes, I learned that um, when I. Um, when I um, got sick that uh, I could, there were things that I couldn't do, but I found that if I put things around me and I will, if it doesn't work out that, you know, it's too hard for me to do or things like that, then I'll change it. Just, yeah. you know, and as, then I find a solution to, you know, if I find that difficult, I'll try something and, yeah, I think, too, and that's a very interesting point, because I've been thinking about this for some reason lately in my own sewing room, that I had just created my sewing room last fall, kind of a thing when I decided that, okay, I was done. I did a lot of crafts, too, in paper crafting. I started out as a scrapbooker and graduated eventually to all kinds of other things and into quilting and that. But then when I redesigned my whole craft room to be more my sewing room, I am still, it is still fluid because like say, you know, you find, well, that doesn't work so well over there, but I think some people are afraid once they've done their little designer sewing room, you know, and you see it on YouTube and they're, they're beautiful, everything coordinates and whatnot. I think they're afraid to touch it to make yep. things a little bit more convenient. So my room is constantly going undergoing an evolution as I figure out what's the most comfortable placement. And of course you get more stuff too. So you got to find space exactly. as yeah. well. And that's, but, that's what I found about, um, I have a lot of knit fabric. So I, and so I use a lot of, and poly cottons and things like that. So I had to find an organization. I was digging through boxes. And so I come up with a solution that I can store my fabric so I can all see them and everything yeah. and I'm just now getting into more the 100% cottons but um yeah you you make an interesting point too now you can see your fabrics and I found that too I was storing my fabrics in like drawers well I still do on some cases 
But if I don't, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. You don't know what you've got. And I find it's inspirational to look at my shelves of fabric, the colors and everything like that. And that inspires me. So, yeah, I think it's very important, to, if you can, to store your fabrics where you can see them. So, you know, right. you can be and an I, inspiration. Yeah. And I bounce from one craft to another, depending on how I feel and what I feel I can accomplish. Right. And um, so actually my room is, um, you can see everything. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you'd be surprised at what I have. <laughs> well, mine's kind of like that too, <laughs> as well. But that's okay. Like you said, your sewing room is your sanctuary. And yeah, it's my happy place. I spend yeah. most of my day in my sewing area so you know you have to make it comfortable you have to make it inspirational it has to be a place you want to spend all that time in so should never be afraid to move things around you know it's nothing is written in stone is the way I look at it so my next question for you then is do you have a favorite tool and or technique um I don't think I really have a favorite tool um other than of course the seam ripper which does <laughs> yeah. well. um and uh, as far as technique or whatever i i'm um i started into paper piecing um f foundation paper piecing and i guess that that is something that i found that my accuracy um has improved of uh, doing things that way uh and um techniques not really i i bounce around from everything you know i'll kind of go with whatever grabs you at the time exactly or yeah. if i see something and i will look at it or if i find something on youtube that i've been watching it's like okay now does that really work and i'll go off on a you know tangent and try that for a while yeah yeah yeah, that, yeah. I think that's, again, I think that's a good thing because it keeps you, it keeps you interested, I think, and it challenges your mind too. And I, I'm a great believer that as we grow older, that's the most important part of our body. We have to keep going is our brain, you know, yeah. because if you, if you stop that, you might as well be gone because there's I, nothing else left. Yes, I totally uh, agree. And that's, that's what was happening to me. Um, when I stopped being caregiver, uh, it was like, okay, it's um, now the rest of my life is all about me. And it was hard to go from transitioning to always being focused on somebody else and finally being able to say, okay, I can do whatever I want. Right. And it was hard, really hard. And yeah. as soon as I um, as soon as I did start to put myself out and sort of talk to people and join groups or whatever, then COVID hit. And it was like, oh, now I'm back to where I started, you know, <laughs> this isolated person. Yeah. And I, um, I have so much enjoyed being able to talk to people again. And yeah, it's, and get out yeah. there. Yeah, because yeah. it is very easy for us to I think for anybody to lock themselves away, given, you know, uh, a, a crisis in their life of some sort, or in your case, you know, being a caregiver all the time, then suddenly you don't have to do that anymore. It's the same with like a retirement. I, you know, right. um, I've been retired 10 years and don't regret one day of it. I loved my job, but I love my retirement even more. But a lot of people go into retirement and then they end up sitting in front of a television set or whatever, and they just sort of fade away. And yeah. no, no, too many other things I need to do. I'm not ready to fade. So, exactly. Yep. Well, and as, as you always say, you know, go big or go home. Well, like yep. I said, I'm going big and I'm not going home for a while. So, yep. yeah. I mean, the worst thing you can do is so it didn't quite work out. Chalk it up to experience. Move on to the next thing kind of a deal don't dwell on you know the things that didn't work dwell on what you learned from it and push on yeah. ahead so um if you had now you you're sewing on what, what's your principal sewing machine um actually i have um three fafs and i have a serger a singer serger that 
is I can't believe this singer surgery has lasted this long. It's like, oh my God. But I have a, um, I've got a one faff that is from the 70s. And then I graduated to a, uh, graduated to um, an electronic one. I still have it and it still works. It just squeaks and I haven't been able to find somebody. And then um, when I was looking after my mom, um, I went out and I splurged on the Bath Creative 4.5. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, um, I still love my original Faf, but uh, the 4.5 is kind of my... Uh, Your go-to. Yeah. Yeah. With that. So if you had all the money in the world, is there some, a piece of equipment that you'd invest in? Oh, Yes. Definitely a long arm, but then I'd have to find a place to put it. And put I, think, it. yeah, I I have a, a long space that I could put it. It's just um, I wouldn't be able to have company. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you could have quilters over then. And instead, right. they'd understand about right. that. Yeah, I did. And the thing was that um, you know I'd looked at them and I'd looked at the smaller ones and everything, and I had gone to a show. Um, it was a craft show or something, and they had uh, they had long arms there, and they let you try them out. Mm-hmm. And so I I wrote out my name, and it was oh this is fun. Yeah, <laughs> but it stopped there. Yep. Oh, I know the feeling. Uh, but uh, so um, we're both members of the Quilters Way, so an online membership group. But have you ever belonged to a guild or another online group? Um. No guilds because, um, like I said, I don't go out. Um, I pretty much stay in the house. Um, but I do belong to another online membership. I only belong to two. One is the Quilters Way, and the other one is um, it is uh, piecing it real with Yvette Renee, and that's how I got started into. Uh, the FPP and I was watching her channel and she had a giveaway when she reached 10,000 subscribers and I won the giveaway and it was a year's subscription to her foundation paper piecing group and so I still belong to that when my one year was up then I read I joined and everything and I'm enjoying it they uh, I only have Zoom meetings with um, uh, Chatterbox Quilt, The Quilter's Way, and of course, um, Piecing It Real. And I, uh, that's pretty much the only um, ones I do. I, I don't belong to any guilds um, for the simple fact that, I, like I said, I just don't go out. Right. And you know, I'm, I'm wondering these days how, how much longer actual in-person guilds are going to last because I did belong to a guild that was an in-person one then COVID came and we went to Zoom and I'm no longer a member of that guild but I the Quilters Way I do belong to is the other group and I belong to uh, the Canadian Male Quilters as well um, through Facebook group on that and they get together every now and then and do a a Zoom too and I I quite enjoy those but the reason I'm saying that I think in-person guilds me start to die out a little bit is because you know it's more convenient for people to meet online and Mm -hmm. the guild itself they have to pay for a place to meet and all those expenses that are there so you know they can save a lot of money of course there's always going to be people who like the you know the human contact in the same room kind of a thing and that's fine but um yeah, I think guilds are starting to evolve thanks to COVID into more of the online world. And mm-hmm. it's kind of nice too, because people from all over the place can join these. And right. you, meet, you meet like on we're the filters way. Yeah. We're all over the place, you know, Holland, the States, Canada, you know, out there. So it's kind of interesting to see what people from other parts of the world, they're vision of what quilting is and and that kind of thing Mm -hmm. so my next question for you then is do you have any favorite well do you okay if you don't go out a lot how do you get your supplies do you order a lot online um 
No, I have ordered a little bit online, um, but uh, I basically, as far as fabrics and things like that, I'm a, uh, of course, being on a, you know, strict budget and everything, um, except when it comes to income tax time, which I just got my income tax. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, uh, when I get that, I go out and splurge. And most of it's from Walmart. There are um, a few stores that um, uh, I do go to, but um, it's all pretty much too expensive. And I really don't think I'm that experience to be able to spend like twenty, thirty dollars a meter on fabric. Yeah, fabric so, gone up. Yeah, and so I. That's why I pretty much just buy from Walmart. And uh, if my daughter wants me to make something for her, then we go to, um, you know, the, the tons of quilt stores here in Calgary. Yeah, and. Um, uh, lots of online places and everything but i don't buy too much other than at walmart right that, yeah. Yeah. yeah but you're you're right that fabric has just in the last year it has just been going skyrocket now mm -hmm. it looks like the average price of a meter of of quilting cotton is like 2021 $20, dollars or more a, a, mm -hmm. a meter and it's just ridiculous and um the other thing too about like I love to, to to buy online, but I love to go into the store too because I find you know you see all those fabrics later. Feel you it. Feel it. Yeah, <laughs> you feel it. But um, I I buy a lot online, uh, quite a bit from that as well. Now you must have a better Walmart out in your end of the world because our warm Walmart does not have fabric. Oh, ours does not have yardage. What it has is um, a small section that is pre-cuts, like it'll come in um, two yards and it's rolled up mm. and, uh, or fat quarters. Um, they did have some three yard cuts, but uh, I almost got stung this last time was that their bundles, they had um, two yard cuts and uh, mixed in with the hundred percent St. Cottons were um, 65 poly 35 cotton. Oh. And so I almost picked up a, a blend rather than like I wanted to work with 100% cottons. Right. And uh, yeah, but uh, that's, I like to go yeah. shopping and look. My yeah. daughter, yeah, my daughter usually takes me around. So yeah, if I want to go someplace, I do drive and that, but I prefer not to. Yeah, I'm actually kind of the same way. <laughs> I don't like, I don't really want to drive. I like to get out, but I don't want to drive. But luckily, my husband drives me. <laughs> I call it driving Miss Daisy. So <laughs> with it all. But luckily, he sews too. So, you know, we share a common interest yes. there, except he does garments. Yes. I and do I seen, yeah, I've seen Walter's shirts that yeah. he makes and everything. So, yes. Oh, yeah. He's good at it. Real good at it. So, but that's how I get a new wardrobe. Uh, so that's okay too. Yeah. So my net, oh, the other thing I want to say too, is you were talking about the number of stores in Calgary. On my channel, when I review every week an online store, the vast majority I've been finding since I started doing that reviews over a year ago, they all come from Alberta. Alberta's got to be the quilting central of Canada. I'm yeah. starting to think. Yeah, and the other thing is that I found is there's lots of... Um, like you know the communities around calgary um there are lots of quilting stores or and and some of them are just online yeah they're you know they're not physical stores but they're online yeah but yes i've uh, i've come across quite a few yeah see in my area where we don't have that many we have well principally there are two close to me and then there's a third one i go to that's a little further away but no there used to be more in this mm -hmm. area but they all closed up but yeah. yeah but the calgary or alberta i'm gonna have to go to alberta i can do a lot of shopping across alberta i can see that coming if you and you and kim and i and we'll have to go around yeah. to the quilt stores yes yeah, yeah i don't know how i'll get it all home 
I may just have to drive to Alberta uh, for that. And that's not an impossibility either. But anyways, uh, so that's my next question here. Um, okay, do you have any favorite, uh, I'm going to call them experts, people you turn to, to learn like on YouTube or the internet or something like that? I, the, I like, um, I, Eleanor Burns, I guess, because um, uh, with the log cabin, that's what, right. and I did find some of her videos. Um, she, she's a bit quirky to me, but. Yeah, yeah um, I know what you mean. I watch yeah, her too. <laughs> um, as far as um, somebody that I really um, gravitate towards that I, I would say that I, I really can't pick one. No, too um, many to choose from. Yeah, and I, 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 I learn from each one. Yeah. And, and the other thing is I not only learn the good things, but the bad things too, that, you know, things that don't work for me. Yeah. That yeah. Um, ways of doing things um, like putting half square triangles together or something like that. Um, but again, like I've tried them all. It's like, okay, what is going to work for me? Yeah. And I think that's the key. You got to find something that works for you too, because it is a hobby and it's supposed to bring you joy. And if you're struggling with a technique and you're not really enjoying it, then that kills it. You got to find something that works for you. Better way. Yeah. yeah. So um, do you have any challenges or goals for the future in terms of projects you might like to do? And I'm sure you do. <laughs> oh, yes. I'd like to. Um, I'd like to use up all my fabric before I. <laughs> um, that's not going to happen. But. Um, uh, no, I, I guess it would be finishing up the things I have. Um, I don't have any outlet to, you know, do or to get rid of the things that yeah. I make. My my poor daughter, actually, she is my um, she's my tester. Yeah. And um, so I will make a table runner and I usually make table runners. I usually finish table runners. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um but um, she is my tester. And so when I make something, I say, here, take this, use it, whatever. And um, so far, nothing's fallen apart. So I guess my goals would just be to be able to um, keep doing what I'm doing and be able to have somebody, you know, use the thing. I don't care where they appreciate it, just no, use just it. Use it. <laughs> Yeah. 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 That is a problem. We are fairly prolific as quilters, I think. And what do you do with them? Like for me, I have a guest bedroom bed that is full of quilts. I have given a few away. Um, part of that is because I'm, I'm a relatively new quilter. I've only been doing this now for about five years. So mm -hmm. with each thing I make, you know, I, I have, a little bit of a, what do you want to call? I'm possessive of it, I guess. But the fact is, I full, I finished it, I fold it up, I put it on the guest bedroom bed, and I forget about it because now I'm on to the next project. It's the journey. For me, it's the journey. It's not the final product. That's just, okay, that's done. That means now I can move on to my next project uh, yeah. kind of a thing. And so I'm trying to, and I know people give, up, give quilts to charities and all kinds of things like that, and that's great. But there's something that holds me back from doing that because I want to know the person who I'm giving it to, yes. you know, kind of a thing right now. Now, having said that, I think I am starting to ease up a little bit on this. I just gave a quilt away last week uh, to a friend because he's going to go through some trying times because he's just been diagnosed with cancer kind of a thing. So I thought mm -hmm. this might bring people say the quilts help with that. They bring comfort. So I gave that to him. And um, so now I don't know, what am I saying? I need to find more sick people to give quills to. <laughs> that sounds depressing. <laughs> Not really. Like, oh, okay, oh, you're sick. Have a quilt. Uh, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. So but, I guess my family aren't as interested in it. That's the thing. I've given quilts to my nephew and to my niece at Christmas time. My sister doesn't really want one. She's a cross mm -hmm. stitcher. That's her mm -hmm. life yeah. and kind of a deal. So I don't know. I just, I just have to expand out, I guess, but and get, because what am I going to do with them? And you know, yeah. the sad part is when we're gone, somebody will clean out our stuff 
and they won't appreciate them. And those will end up in a charity shop or in a landfill or something like that. I'm taking um, it with me. I'm sorry. Yep, that's why I tell people to, I'm taking it with me. No, <laughs> put it on there. Of course, as an aside here, my sister sent me a picture uh, the other day on Facebook. I guess a lady um, had passed away and at her funeral in the church, all of the quilts she had given to people, mm -hmm. they had brought them and they put them on the pews in the church. It was quite a nice art uh, quilt display, really. And mm -hmm. my sister says, well, here's an idea for you. And I says, what, are you figuring on that I'm kicking off real quick? She's like, no, no, no. I just meant like for displaying your quilts. So, yeah. <laughs> Go to church and see my quilts. <laughs> yeah, see my church. Yeah, come to the funeral, stay for the quilts. I don't know. <laughs> and, yeah, the the other thing is that um, I I don't buy expensive fabrics. I don't. Uh, I'm not into designers and things like that. So everything I make, I want it to be useful. Um, I don't want it to be put on a shelf someplace. And you know, I want things to be to be used. Yeah. Um, and that's why I don't make too many things that, you know, like, like ornaments and, and, and craft stuff and things like that. I want everything to be used that, you know, it's because I've saved so many things throughout my life that are not really useful, Yeah. But, you know, and, and you just end up collecting them. So yeah, uh, yeah give use them you know and i don't care if the dog takes one of my blankets or one of my quilts that i made you know as whatever you know he's, using it. <laughs> he's yeah. using it yeah i think that that's true enough and i think as we get older too i i find this myself i i was kind of a collector all my life but it was collecting useless things right and now i'm i'm getting rid of a lot of that kind of stuff. And I think you do go through a stage in your life where you start to look at this and go, yeah, it was fun at the time. I think it's time to just get rid of that, give it out kind of a thing. But that kind of puts me into the my next question for you because I have a very strong feeling, um, well, not a feeling, it's I believe this, that quilters are artists. And the reason I say that is because there are a lot of, snobby people out there in the art community who figure if it's not hanging in a museum and it's not on canvas or it's not a sculpture it is not art it is craft and they use the word craft as though it's a dirty word and yeah. i don't i don't believe that craft is a dirty word i believe it's art so as an artist because you are um how would you describe yourself and i think you've already told me right uh, yeah, very, um, I, I guess maybe spontaneous. I don't know whether that yeah. way to describe it. It's, um, um, uh, and I'm all over the place. You know, I just, I have to try everything and that's, uh, yeah, I guess I am an artist, aren't I? Yeah. Yes, you are yeah. an artist. We all yeah. are. And, uh, I'd also say, because you're saying that you want your, um, quilts and that, the things that you make to be used I would call you a practical artist yes that's a good you know it's not just going to hang there on a wall it is something that yeah. people can touch can use and the whole bit and I think and I think that is important because there's great pieces of art in the world but you have to stand afar to admire it in the whole bit you if you get too close to it and there's somebody standing there over top of you like beating you off with a stick and saying, no, 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 you can't do that. Which brings me to the expression quilt police. Oh, quilt okay. police. I, I'm, I haven't been arrested yet. So, okay. <laughs> no, I don't think any of us have ever been arrested, but what, what comes to your mind when you hear the expression quilt police? Um, I guess um, quilt police, the rules, or what they call rules um, that you know, okay, no, you can't use this in a quilt. I mean, I've made quilts with corduroy in them. Yeah. <laughs> and denim. Um, and the thing is, quilt police, I guess, oh, no, you can't use this in a quilt, can't use that in a quilt. Um, 
I guess that's what I would say is the quilt police or that you're not doing it the right way or you're not using 100% cottons or you're not using the right thread and things like that. Right. And I mean, I use what I have. And uh, I, I sort of looked, I always thought, you know, quilting was um, years ago, they made quilts out of um, garments that, you know, they cut up their old clothing and things like that. And um, why did they use 100% cotton? Because that's all there was. Yeah, exactly. you know, there, there wasn't these fabrics. So, um, and so I, I just think that police means, um, like, yeah, I guess, you know, not doing things the right way or, or what someone else right. thinks is right. Well, I think quilt police are basically people who are not, not artistic and the reason I say that is because if you follow if a great artists in the world they broke the rules and that's why they became great because they created they something unique. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. and so you know I think anybody who says oh no 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 you you can't mix your fabrics uh, it has to be done this particular way that they've killed the creative spirit in themselves by thinking like that you have to think outside of the box right you know, yeah. because that's how you create great things. And that's why I think why I'm I would like to get more into the art quilt kind of thing, because that definitely breaks all the rules. And if I have somebody standing on my sh shoulder and telling me you can't do that, I'll just turn around, and look at them and go, well, I'm doing it anyways. So <laughs> you go away yeah. from that kind of thing. The other thing that I think, like with art quilts and everything like that, um, and the same thing is my, the quilts that I make, I want them to be used. Nowadays, everything is disposable. Right. And so it's like, okay, when I make a quilt, I want it to be used so I can make another one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, and the other thing is with the art quilts, um, and even with my own quilts that I make, it's like uh, an art quilt it's more or less to be displayed. To be displayed. And yeah. if I could find an, a, a gallery where I could display all my quilts and everything like that, it's like, I want people to see them. I want people to use them. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think that's where I, over the years, because I was isolated and things like that, it's like, okay, I want you to see this. And, yeah. you know, I'm going to share what I make. Yeah. Well, let's face it. We're all very proud of what we create and we want other people to appreciate it because yes, bit, some people say that's a bit of ego and it probably is, but you know, it doesn't hurt to get stroked every now and then, oh, you know, definitely. So, you yeah. know yeah. there's too much abuse as there is in the world already. So if we can right. glean from that a little bit of praise, you know, and it makes our day, then I'm all for that. That's good yeah. mental health, I think. And, you know, you just gave me an idea for an art installation. Oh, put all your quilts on display, but in, but drape them over furniture and invite people to come in and wear them, you know, oh. stuff like that. Yeah. So My that, <laughs> I think that would be an interactive experience getting up close and personal to a quilt. Yeah. And that's something I don't think anybody's ever really done before. Uh -huh. No. Yeah, okay. come on, my idea. It. Copyright to me. Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll okay. talk. We'll see how we can do that. <laughs> Give me honorable mention, please. Yeah. Yes, I will. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, so speaking of honorable mention, let's talk about your YouTube channel. Uh, yes, my YouTube. Around to it is what it's called. And I will have that down in the show notes, uh, the link to that uh, okay. as well. But why? how long ago did you start the YouTube channel and why? Oh, actually, it's funny because um, my daughter has a YouTube channel and she was she was doing um, she does card making and junk journals and things. And she um, I was knitting and I started it sort of in August. And that's when I, I was, you know, after COVID was coming to an end, but then it was like, OK, it's really not over yet. Yeah. And I was just at that point where I needed I needed to have contact with people and everything. And um, also um, every November, 
my daughter and I go to a craft sale and we do our things. And of course, I my mom taught me to make these slippers. And so she said, well, you know, I'd like to know how to do it. She says, why don't you make a video? And I said, okay, you know, and so I made a video on making these slippers that my mom taught me how to make. And it was like, oh my gosh, now there's 7,000 views. And I put it on, you, of course, put it on YouTube. And I've got one of them that's like 7,000 views. And I thought, what the heck is this? <laughs> and um, I, um, and the, the channel name came from um, when I hadn't had any videos yet. And so she said, mom, when are you going to start to do a video? And I said, oh, I'll get around to it. And <laughs> well, that came about. So now, um, like, I've got tons of videos that I need to upload. I need to edit them and everything. But I hate editing. But um, so that's basically how that came about. And then when I, um, I was getting subscribers, and it was like, I mean, I don't have a whole bunch. But then I thought, oh, this is fun. I've got something to occupy my mind. Right. I don't have to worry about all my problems. I can, um, you know, do this. And it's like, I'm, I'm just a newbie at this, let me tell you. But it's fun. It it's, is. It, it is, is time consuming, yeah. but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, um, I always, like, I had trouble that I wouldn't talk to anybody for days. And then it was like when my daughter phoned me and it was like I couldn't talk to her because my voice would go. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, my God, now I talk to the camera and, you know. Yep. And yeah. it's, it's an extension of talking to other people in, yeah. in a sense, you know, that that's what goes through my mind when I'm doing my uh, YouTube stuff, too, as well. And, yeah, it's fun to do. I'm like, yeah. you know, I don't like editing that much. So I try not to. And it's probably yeah. quite apparent <laughs> on my YouTube channel, too. But <laughs> But, you know, it's just fun. And that's what I do it uh, for. It's just another fun. outlet of creativity is the way yeah. I look at it. Well, yours yeah. will grow. Yours is going to grow. And oh, I uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think you're going to get a whole bunch of new subscribers after they see this interview on here. So and that's that really when I started it, that wasn't my goal. The And another, I guess it's maybe a selfish view, but I the way I looked at it was um, I spent most of my life learning everything. Like I said, my brain is a sponge and that sponge is getting a little too full. Now I got to wring it out. Bring it out. Yeah. <laughs> Onto YouTube. Yeah. yeah. And the thing was that um, since making my videos, my, um, my granddaughter has made herself a pair of slippers, which we live far apart. And the other thing was that um my mom always used to make the best Christmas cake mm. and I never got her to teach me. She taught me how to make slippers, but she never taught me how to make, how to make cake. <laughs> and actually that's one of the things too, that um, I always wanted to ask my mom questions about, well, how do you do this? You know, how, and she's not here anymore. So right. it's like, okay, I'm going to make videos. And then when my kids want to know how I made something, they can watch a video. Watch the video. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it's, you know, again, here we go back to the technology. It is spreading. You know, it used to be you had to go to a library if you yeah. want to look up something. Now yeah. the library is in our home through the internet. And there's such a wealth of information across the world coming from just ordinary everyday people because everybody yeah. knows something, yep. you know? So, yeah, and that's why I do the YouTube videos, too. I figure if someone if someone can learn something that I have learned and it helps them, or even because I call it the idiot quilter, is because I share my mistakes. Yeah. You know, I'm not into the polish and everything like that. You know, you watch a video, oh, you do this, you do this, you do this, it comes out perfect every time. No, I know that there are in-between stages that that did not work. And so... Oh, yeah. I want to see how people have uh, gotten over those mistakes. How did right. they fix them? That's yeah. more interesting than seeing perfect every time. And then yeah. getting frustrated when you try to follow those steps and you make mistakes, right? So, yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, I think it's great that you want to share, you know, what's in your sponge with yeah. everybody. I think that's a good thing. My brain, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. got to read it out once in a while. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. That's why I say sometimes I forget things because it wasn't important enough to, to me. Be, I have, have to have room for new things. In yes, I, yeah. Or my, my husband always used to say my, um, my pie department is low. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta make a pie now. Yeah. Yep. So I have little compartments in my, in my brain and sometimes they, yes. Yep. You have to, you gotta new make room stuff. for new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That. So um, to finish up our time together here, I just want to ask you, do you have any advice for anyone who wants to get started in this form of art? Um, yes, I would say start small. Um, um, soak up all the information that is out there and find what works for you and be prepared to have to put together shelves for all your fabric. Um, <laughs> <laughs> save up for the sewing machine of your dream or a long arm um, and don't give up. Uh, Very good advice. Don't give up. Um, yep. If one way doesn't work, try another. Yep. You know, it's, it, it's, and enjoy it. Find yeah. what you like to do and do it. Yeah, Just, life's too short to do exactly. things you don't like to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If it's not yeah. bringing you joy, move on. Yeah. And I guess that's what um, uh, the advice is. Um, don't give up. That's yeah. pretty much, yeah. Yep. And you know, if you if you don't have expen or if you don't have a fabric stash or whatever, go to the dollar store. Start out by not using expensive fabric that you know, buy an old sheet or something like that and practice on that. And uh, trust me, nobody ever made a beautiful quilt their first time. No. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and if, if that's what you want to do, then Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. And, and don't, the other thing I guess too, is that if you're young or even if you're old, um, uh, start, just start and go for it. Um, there were a lot of things like when I was younger, I wish I would have done, but I was too afraid to yeah. do things and go for it. Just yeah. Do it. Be fearless. Be that's fearless, right. I think. Yeah. That's, well, that's yeah. yeah. Well, this has been great, Shirley. Is there do you have any anything else you'd like to say before we end the interview? Um, just I want to thank you very much and uh for offering to do this interview with me. And I have enjoyed it immensely. And um actually we behaved ourselves quite nicely. Yes, we did. We did. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yes, but yes, it's been a lot of fun. Well, I, I thank you so much too for agreeing to do this uh, with me as well. This has been great. I've really enjoyed our time together. And of course, we'll be in touch as oh, yes, of course. way and other things too. So I'm just, I'm going to end the recording now, but don't go away. So okay. once again, thank you, Shirley. And for everybody watching this, do check out Shirley's YouTube channel. And Thanks. it's around to it. And the link will be in the show notes below. So check it out and support Shirley with it because we want good channels to grow. And hers is one of the best. So thank you, thank you Shirley.